as you said earlier on, the survival with sports, our innate survival is built within us. It's built within each of us. It's built within each of ourselves. So when we are, if it's this way, it has to be automated. We can't think about it, right? So how do we get it automated? Through the autonomic nervous system, through the sympathetic system. And we respond in two basic ways. One, by fighting. That's an inflammatory response. That's the cytokine storm. We fight and we burn the field in the same time. And or we run away, we hide. How do we hide? By isolating ourselves. How do we isolate ourselves? By creating a micro environment which is no longer available to the environment. So biochemistry, physiologically, we create a lattice formation. Galactin-3 binds to each other and to inflammatory ligands. It creates a pentamere, five different ones, and they bind to each other, and they create a coating. And this is why the isolation is so destructive. It's destructive on a cellular level, on a tissue level, but it's destructive on an emotional level. On a community level, we see it right now in our countries, the divisions, you know, it's all, I mean, for us to really heal, we need to accept that other people are gonna have a different opinion. That's part of communication. So <clears throat> once the survival response become, doesn't turn off, so in the nervous system, we have the sympathetic and we have the parasympathetic. We can take a deep breath, meditate, listen to music, dance, the body will relax but we also have a biochemical response that starts within minutes. And I've published two landmark papers on this in the last year in very prestigious journal. This biochemical response starts with galactin-3. So galactin-3 goes up in minutes. And if you measure, for example, interleukin-6, which is a driver of the inflammatory immune response, it will rise later than galactin-3. And when you block galactin-3, it will attenuate the rise of interleukin-6. So what do I mean? We, for example, published two papers on acute kidney injury, which is a big problem with COVID and in sepsis and in certain surgeries when you don't have good blood supply. And we showed that if we blocked galactin-3, it will prevent the damage to the tissue. It will prevent death in the animal studies. And galactin-3 will be a marker of who will get very sick or die in the intensive care unit. So galactin-3 is this alarming that stays on and it drives inflammation and fibrosis in general. Initially years ago, we thought more in cancer, but also in immediate acute sepsis infections. Now this is highly, highly, highly relevant to cancer, of course. Absolutely. Now, you, you mentioned that galactin-3 coats, it has a coating. So does it coat the individual cells? Is it called the, the tumor? How does it coat? So it coats both. So galactin-3, so maybe I'll take a step and I want to a little bit give the people who are going to watch this a sense of wow, okay? It's really a wow, okay? So if we look at our body, we <clears> are <throat> not aware that we have, I'm going to round up, okay? About 50 trillion cells, okay? So trillion is a million, big number already, times a thousand, like thousand millions is a billion, a thousand times is a trillion, 50 times. Wow. Each cell, and I wasn't aware of it, has up to one million reactions a second. And this body is functioning with pretty much infinite reactions every second. So just us being alive and be able to talk now is truly a miracle. That's a miracle of life. I mean, we should be grateful just for being part of this miracle, you know. And then each cell knows that it has a role. I like to use the, the analogy of a beehive, where each bee contributes to, to, to the beehive. I, I raise bees as a hobby for many years. It's, it, it helps me to really feel and understand this. But uh, so, so each cell knows that it's going to come into existence. It's going to function. It's going to die when the times come through apoptosis and another cell will come. We understand and we let go of this idea that things are not gonna change. But a certain cell decides that it doesn't want to die, but it's gonna get a signal to that it's going has to die. So what does it do? It creates a microenvironment. It isolates itself 
and it creates an environment of crisis, an environment which is deprived of oxygen, even in the presence of oxygen in the whole system. Okay, so galactin three creates this. As a result, our macrophage, our immune cells, become inflamed. Our receptors to the cell change. Our insulin receptors gets blocked. Our p53 gets suppressed. Our our a a a AMPK is the main pathway to produce normal. Uh, mitochondrial metabolism gets blocked and the cell now has a sense that it is no oxygen because it's shifted into a crisis metabolism. There's something called hypoxia inducing factor. The mitochondria gets blocked and we moved into a cancer metabolism. Also metabolism for autoimmunity, for diabetes, but today we're talking about cancer. And now suddenly the cell is under crisis. It needs energy fast. It needs to duplicate, to replicate. Well, if you go into glycolysis, you can get energy 100 times faster. But what is the price? For every molecule of glucose, you get two molecules of ATP instead of 36. So of course, you're going to produce lactic acid, less oxygen, cancer becomes even more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So that's how cancer survives. How does the cancer do it? Well, remember, the cancer cell decided that it has its own, its own kingdom. It's no longer listening to the body, right? That's the basis of cancer. It, it doesn't listen to the body anymore. And then what does it do? It wants to survive. What do we do when we want to survive? We use galactin-3. What does this cancer does when you want to survive? It also uses galactin-3. What does the COVID does when it wants to survive? It uses galactin-3. The spike protein of the COVID is almost identical to galactin-3. What do, what do parasites and infections do? They use galactin-3. Everybody wants to survive. Now, what happens when the cancer wants to survive with galactin-3? Galactin-3 will shut down the immune response. For example, patients getting pdl one inhibitor immunotherapy, if their galactin-3 is elevated, the immunotherapy is not going to work. Why? Because the immune system is not working. So this is the process. And then our challenge, our journey is how do we melt this isolation? How do we allow the body to reconnect with its healing capacity while getting help from our own inner resources? And we'll talk later what is our main resource from supplements, from lifestyle, and from conventional oncology when it's cancer. It's all about integration. So that's why galactin-3 is so fundamental in cancer. Now, so how does modified citrus pectin affect galactin-3? What, what exactly does it do to it? Right, so galactin-3 also, when it travels, it brings growth factors like VGF, it brings cancer-promoting factors to, the, to, to different places. What modified citrus pectin does, the galactin-3 has this structure called carbohydrate recognition domain, where it binds to the different damaging um, uh, ligands and carry them on. Galactin-3 will come, will display the, the ligand and will break down the pentamere. So what it does, it dissolves the lattice formation. And now first the tissue can get oxygen. It's no longer in crisis. You know, one of the questions I ask my patient when I do healing for them, I really use my hands with the COVID, it's a little bit less. I ask, I really want to connect to their cancer cell what made you not be able to take a deep breath? Because cancer is a disease of the cancer not being able to take a deep breath and feel it's okay. Things change, you know? It goes into a fighting mode. That's, the stronger the fighting mode, the more glucose the cancer take, right? That's why PET scan, the higher the readings, the more aggressive. The more abnormal pathways, the more aggressive it becomes. It's, it's we are here, the reason why the survival paradox is truly a paradigm shift, because it puts things together in so many, many levels. So we want to shift this part. So, so modified it was in breaks this part, and now the immune system can respond. You know, I was sharing with you that we just published a multi-center trial in prostate cancer, which is really has similarities with breast cancer. It, it's uh, it's hormonally driven and and in this, in this study, a multi-center, our third study to show the same result, six different 
high level academic institute tested people whose prostate was removed. So let's say somebody had a mastectomy or lumpectomy. And then now there is biochemical relapse. In prostate cancer, you can follow the PSA when there's no prostate and it starts going up before you can even see the cancer. And then you know all of them, they're all going to, the cancer is gonna come back. And in close to 80%, we're able to slow down or stop or reduce the PSA. Most of them, we reduced it. And now we haven't published yet the 18 months follow-up. We are seeing the same result long-term. So what really happened? The modified cytospectin, our modified cytospectin didn't kill the cancer. It's not a cytotoxic. It allowed the body to deal with the disease because it exposed the cancer. It regulated the immune response. It reduced the inflammation. And that's really what you and I are interested in, in the healing power of the body. And each of us, each of you is going to have their own journey. What I tell people and I emphasize in the book, the book is not a recipe. It has about 80 pages of protocols at the end, very high quality protocols. But the book is not about a recipe. It's about understanding. Because each of us has to build their own individual journey. When people ask me, if you have a protocol, I tell them, yes, my only protocol is that I don't have a protocol because each person is a whole world. And we really have to allow the person to express themselves, to connect with themselves. So one level I do it when I teach meditation and healing, what I call open heart medicine. And I'll, another level I do it with my research with, with the pectosol, with modified cytospectin, with the over 75 published papers and or with therapeutic apheresis, we have to integrate. It's really, it's a complex disease. It's a complex condition. It needs a multifaceted answer, as you know so well, you know. So how did you discover or think about the citrus pectin had to be modified, that you had to do something to it to break it down into smaller molecules? The initial, initial research by Dr. Avram Raz used a low molecular weight pectin. And nobody really understood. We actually is the only one who demonstrated it actually gets absorbed into the bloodstream. <clears throat> so we understood the mechanism, but we had to refine the structure and make it reproducible. You know, it's not uh, enough to do like 100 grams in the lab. You know, we produce tens of thousands of, of kilograms. We produce, you know, like 100,000 pounds that if all of them have to be pretty much the same. But really, modified it to spectin because it's such a natural product. It has multiple functions. If you try to isolate it to one specific molecule, it will lose its magic because it has a powerful chelation of heavy metals effect. We published a number of papers. It had this powerful immune regulating effect, which we published. It has this regulation of excessive inflammation and fibrosis. And it also works synergistically with so many other treatments. You can use modified to spectrum with radiation, <clears throat> with hormonal therapy, with chemotherapy. We've, we've published on all of this and other people have published. So it's really exciting. It, it is very, very exciting. Now you talk about softening your grasp at survival. And how can a patient do that? You know, when you're given that cancer diagnosis, or perhaps, you know, you're now stage three, stage four, and your conventional doctors are telling you that things aren't looking good for you. How does a patient turn that around by softening that grasp of survival? So that's, that's a big journey. That's a, that's a big secret. <laughs> and that's really my, my journey for the rest of my life to share this, because that's what I, I came about with my meditation and I shared my story as a, whole, as a survival of a Holocaust, you know, of my family and it's in the book. But we really have to look at our body. We explain different cells, how they function. Every, the cell is the smallest independent organ in our body. I mean, you can say that the mitochondria also has boundaries, but the cell has, has boundaries, Dr. V, and the cell decides what comes in and what goes out, just like we do, right? Mm -hmm. The cell wants to take things that are good for the cell, and the cell will let go of things that it doesn't want, what it considers to be toxic. And the tissue will do the same. The organ will do the same. And that's part of our struggle. We want, and we don't, and we don't want. We, we push away, and we take, and it creates a struggle. 
There is one organ in the body that functions differently, whose survival requires it to function different, differently. And that's the secret to healing. It is our heart. Mm -hmm. Our heart has to take dirty blood. It has to, otherwise it won't function. It takes all the stuff that all the organs don't want. It connects with the universe through the lungs, through the breath, right? The, when we breathe, we connect with the infinite. It's amazing world. And then the heart gives without judgment, without discrimination. The aorta is a stiff artery. It spreads blood everywhere. But who does the heart nourish first? It nourishes itself through the coronary, coronary arteries. The heart nourishes itself in order to nourish others and as part of nourishing others. But the amazing thing that demonstrates the selflessness of the heart, the heart is the only organ that takes blood in after it finished its work. You know, you think about it, we could have had a different physiology, right? Where there would be, you, you, you would nourish the heart inside the ventricle. No, no. The heart finished its work, it gave the clean blood, only then it takes care of itself. So connecting with our heart is how we truly let go of the survival part. You know, it takes time. And in the book, I tell the story about, I'm named after my grandfather, Isaac, who I didn't meet, who died at the age 50 in Israel. And it was in 1952. And my grandmother, who lived to 98, when she died in the 2007, on her grave, my mother turned to us, we have five siblings, and said, you know, your grandfather had eight siblings. Five of them were killed by Hitler. We never knew. Nobody told us. It was never spoken. In fact, she didn't know the right number. She said 10 out of 12. In any case, but it was five out of eight because they checked it. In any case, he died from stomach cancer. He couldn't speak about it. He couldn't stomach the trauma. Mm. And my grandmother was a survivor. She overcame two cancers, including inflammatory triple negative breast cancer at the age 82. Okay, so this she was a survivor. And all my life, I felt this very tight pain and pressure at the center of my chest. I kind of point out, I mean, right, right here. And I knew that it's something deep. And... I knew that it's connected to my grandfather, but through my meditation and through my own inner work, I realized that I'm carrying his trauma, which passes genetically and epigenetically. The one chapter before the last in the book, which I really recommend people to read, is called Addressing Your, Your Scars of Survival. It's a multi-generational genetic and epigenetic. I was holding his trauma. And suddenly, just a few years ago, 50 years after having this pain, it's gone. I mean, I'm in my 60s. It's gone. And my chest is open. It's like different. People can see it. But what is the amazing story? My mother, who didn't know about this, this kind of work, but we are, I'm the oldest one and we are very closely, our connection is very deep. She could never see any movies or TV programs on the Holocaust. And suddenly, a few years ago, she was able to suddenly see programs on the Holocaust. She had her own healing. Why? Because my multi-generational healing, it went back to her grandfather and affected her forward. So this is a multi, that's the power of healing from our heart. Mm -hmm. And that's when people have cancer and as some of my students where I teach meditation healing say, they say, Isaac, you are the best person we met who can understand cancer patients who didn't have cancer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're not understanding until you write, because, and this will resonate to each of you. The moment you are diagnosed, your priorities shift. Mm -hmm. you know, when I work with patients, I ask them, what were your priorities a moment before you were diagnosed? What were your priorities a moment after? And what are your priorities now? And that's the journey we have to make. So, so in this sense, it's so multidimensional. And so when we have cancer, when we face death in our face, it gives us an opportunity to let go, to heal. That can be taken away very quickly by the oncologist telling us you have six months to leave and you got to do something in two hours. And if you don't, this, no. One set of fears can be replaced with a set of fears very quickly. So part of the strategy for the cancer patient is not to fall into this trap, to know and uh, also not to connect directly or uh, getting rid of cancer with healing. These are two different processes. But when you 
address your healing, your chance of getting rid of cancer is much, much higher. You know, they are highly connected, but there are two different processes. And some of the greatest healing stories I had in my life, is some patient I really helped for years, but the real healing happened when they ended their life, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about letting go of this holding, because this holding is what drives cancer. So it's a journey. It's fascinating. In yeah. this sense, every patient is amazing. Every person is amazing. Yeah. 